All right. All right. All right. Oh. That, that's muted. There we go. Should be good now. Not sure how many people we're going to get for this, but uh, probably plan on, for the first time in like several years, doing uh, some YouTube content. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> Something new for me this year. That's set up. Uh, so yeah, we're probably just hanging out for 10 minutes or so. I'm gonna write an agenda for myself. Get my screen set up. Feels nice to not be stressed out about doing all the work like I was last time, so. Um, I did take that VOD down because I think, not that I didn't do great work there or anything, but I think that it might incorporate it in the eventual video, and I'm not sure if that is really representative of what the challenge has become, so kind of excited to chat about that for sure. Not sure if any of my mods will be here. I need to get a good frickin' title. What about... Three day challenge... A bit of Yu-Gi-Oh. I actually kind of want to play Yu-Gi-Oh, like the the new stuff. I've never played though. How how difficult is it to learn? I don't have that many thoughts on Master Duel. I just don't um. I don't know like. I just don't know that much about Yu-Gi-Oh. It's see what's cool about it is it seems like it's pretty uh, free to play friendly, though so I do love that. Seems like you can, you know, actually earn a deck on there uh, through just playing playing the games. So I am currently uh, just vibing. We have a match history feature. Um, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to answer that question to be honest. I do personally wish that we had match history. I think it's pretty nice. The bad TCG. Lots more game places just by the resource system. Yeah, it is it is interesting that the resource system is the unit summoning system is like kind of so freeform. I, I could see that being the case. I don't know enough about it to speak authoritatively about it though. So I, I'm not gonna make that mistake. Um, Did I see Mogwai's tweet about Pantheon? No, actually. Should I look it up?
you finished the previous set. So finish is an interesting word. I, I did finish it in terms of how I feel about the project. Let me know if that makes sense or not. Like the set is not complete, right? It's it's around 125 cards. i uh, mechanically and you know, it's there. I definitely need to work on some of the themes of the set um, and making it all feel like it works together. Also, like I have never had a chance to play test the set. Maybe I had a pipe dream of doing that. Like, like if I worked eight hours a day and grinded at it, but that's kind of what I'm going to talk about a bit. I, I do, um, you know, I can share my, um, I can share what I have when I get started for sure. That's kind of the plan for today. Um, probably a short stream. Oh, the bug about the double keywords. Um, I don't actually. So in tomb, when it, when Pantheon comes out of in tomb, he's summoned again, right? So he gets more keywords. But yeah, we'll be starting soon. I, I don't know how long this is going to take. Maybe two hours. Um, maybe two hours. Maybe I'll time box it like one hour on process, one hour on cards. Because I feel like... I like sharing what I made. But also, the big thing that happened was just the realization of... I guess the spoilers are that I learned, even though I've never made a magic card before, I've learned that I can make magic cards very well. And that's not even me being cocky. I, I think objectively I can make magic cards well. The trick to it though, is that you need to build an environment where you can actually make the cards because then it's a lot easier. Like just making a magic card, like a custom magic card is like, like obviously like making a, Making a bunch of custom magic cards is not a set, right? And I didn't I didn't think that it was. Um, but the big thing I learned is that and I when you when I had such a time crunch, I just tried to do everything. And I ended up backtracking a lot. Like for example, like, you know, when I was working on set themes, I worked both on mechanics and thematics instead of picking one route, like thematic or mechanic, like top down or bottom up, and deciding which way to go. Um and had I done it differently, if I knew I had such a little time, I would have just gone one way. So, so it, it's, um, it'll definitely be interesting. I, I actually don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> I have no idea. Have you ever used a magic set editor? No. I, I actually made my own, kind of. <laughs> it's pretty scuffed because I did it in, the spreadsheet I made was like, was like two or three hours of work. I can't really, um... I can't really claim that it's perfect or anything because a lot of the challenge was the time cons time constraint. Um, so yeah, I can share that in chat here. And I'm not some sort of spreadsheet expert or anything. And Glenn Jones has already commented like, yeah, they obviously have some very internal robust tools, um, which, you know, I'm sure that that probably helps a lot, um, but I did my best in like two or three hours to to make something that is workable. Uh, and that's actually part of game design. Part of game design is being able to kind of make tools for yourself to help you solve problems. Um, and that's kind of what I did. So I don't know, it's not, uh, it functions. Um, what I liked about it though, is that I kind of created a guide in terms of what time what time you should be doing things and what you should be thinking about at the beginning of set making, which I, I, I wish it's so funny. Cause I kind of knew that I knew about vision design. I knew about the concept of it. I hadn't really read a lot of Mark Rosewater's articles or anything. I ended up doing that while I was in the challenge, which kind of made it hard to like complete a set in that amount of time. Um, but we did, we did get like, I would say 
pretty far into set creation. I wonder what my best cards are. Yeah, I, I, I don't explicitly... I don't explicitly... Like, in the doc, like, describe how... You set mechanics. Like, luckily Mark Rosewater's made an article on it. Um, and... The biggest thing is that... The biggest advice for set mechanics are, one, I think it's good to, it's going to sound weird, but I think you want to kind of use familiar things, like, like for Ether Batteries, for example, I was bringing back Kaladesh and I really liked, I really liked having a mechanic that was similar to energy and using energy in a different way like ultimately in kaladesh most of the energy outputs are consumed by plus one plus one counters so i was thinking you know what is a way that i can sort of what is the metaphor of energy right and these ether batteries that, that are like these uh tokens that put plus one plus one, plus one, plus one counters on things um and that got me thinking like okay we can do a mechanic that's similar but will have a lot of different synergies and probably work a lot better in an artifact set because you're making token artifacts um but you're constantly kind of tweaking stuff because as i went i kind of realized that um set isn't an artifact set and i'll talk about that when i talk about the set where it's actually like that was the big hook for me was realizing that it's more of an artifact token set like using thopters and ether batteries as opposed to actual artifacts um but i think i'm going to talk about that a bit any, any tips when you brick multiple rounds in a row? So, I realize it's a bit of a troll spider axe, but it's obviously, um, one, in CCGs, there's just things that are out of your control, right? So, what I would say is that focus on the things in the game that you can control, and two, just assume that it's always, your, like, go into any analysis of your gameplay, assuming that you made a mistake, right? It's like, oh, they top deck the Decimate, or for Magic, I guess they top deck the Lava Axe. There's nothing I could have done. Well, there's always something at some point in the game that you could have done differently. Obviously, you know, sometimes in, in CCGs, there's nothing you can do, but that's out of your control. You you can't actually care about that. So that that is my serious advice to maybe a not serious question. What time is it? Oh, it's 2 p.m. All right. So yeah, tricky. Tracy has the has the tech there. Um, you'll just lose twenty percent of the games. You can do nothing about it. Yeah, try not to get too frustrated about it. So this is gonna be maybe scuffed setup. Let's hide the time. Let's hide chat. Let's hide chip. Let's move my camera a bit. All right, so have you joined this the Sunday prayers on time? You have. Welcome, Hashem Shem. You joined right on time. Um, so, hello, YouTube. <laughs> I don't know how to do this, but what I can do is talk. So maybe I'll just start doing that. Um, cool. So welcome, everybody. I uh, did a challenge where I challenged myself to make a magic set in three days. Um, the stipulations of this challenge for that last weekend so so maybe i kind of cheated but we had a three-day weekend with martin luther king day and i was thinking this year i really want to do more game design outside of legends of runeterra especially in the ccg space like something that i'd like to personally work on is to just become a better designer in general um not leaving legends of runeterra or anything actually the exact opposite I, i'm more invested in lr than ever uh, it's just more of a career growth thing. And I was thinking, you know, one thing that I could do potentially this year is actually start a uh, YouTube channel slash Twitch channel where I do game design work. Uh, so this is kind of the result of that. I This is my first challenge. Um, and the stipulations were three days, as much work as I wanted to do, which I kind of capped at like eight hours a day. Um, and I ended up working Saturday, Sunday last week, as well as Saturday this weekend. Uh, in terms of getting this done. And I wanted to complete a magic set. 
And that was all the stipulations I had. So I had no idea what a magic set really was. Like I had played a lot of magic. I didn't know what entailed magic set, um, but I've worked on a lot of Legends of Runeterra sets. So I kind of knew the general structure would be, okay, I kind of find a theme. I then create mechanics on that theme, create characters, create cards, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, what I learned really quickly is that that's not necessarily a formula for a success. Do I do this in some kind of collaboration? No. So let me let me let me mute the sound as well. Um, so what I ended up doing was I started working on a set. And here I have Kaladesh Fragmented Fate. Um, it is a uh, currently it's 125 cards as well as five mechanics. Um, I definitely, definitely probably didn't actually work on this for three days. I would guess that eight hours on stream, as well as like maybe another eight hours off stream went into the design of these cards. Um, and I'll go over that secondarily, but I wanted to first touch on my, my main, um, kind of like what happened, right? Uh, and what happened was I realized that which I think a lot of people predicted that I might be a bit overwhelmed when making a set. Um, and that's not really, I didn't feel as much overwhelmed as I felt like I was kind of going backwards. Like all the time, like I, I made red, right? I made, I made, I made black. I, I made the salvage mechanic, which was like uh, giving, giving your units plus one plus oh for each artifact in your graveyard. Like I thought I was doing good work, but I was constantly backtracking, figuring out, you know, okay, what, what are the themes of my set? What are my gameplay pillars? What kind of architect types do I want? You, you can't really just make a set by making cards. Like individual cards don't actually make a set. And this is something that I learned, especially combined with using uh, the Mark Rosewater uh, skeleton for making, making sets, right? Because here the skeleton kind of shows you like what should be in each color. It literally says, you know, your white, your white creatures should cost this. They should have these keywords. Um, and this was really helpful to an extent, but this Seth skeleton I learned, and he probably says this, like it's pretty obvious, but this should be applied on top of a set that has already completely gone into vision, vision design. It's like the theme is set. You probably have all, already have a lot of your ideas and mechanics. Um, you know, you can actually, this is something I was thinking about could be a fun challenge is you can actually just make a basic magic set with this get skeleton. Like I could, I could make a no mechanic set just using the skeleton, right? Like for example, let's go to just blue, right? Like blue spells. It's like, oh, a counter spell that can counter anything, a lockdown or a card drawing, hand trip, like a combat trick, right? We could definitely make the generic magic set. Um, I don't think the player experience of playing that set would be would be very fun. And what's interesting is that. That is kind of what core sets were for a long time. And Magic actually moved away from making core sets for a long time, uh, only only to move back recently. But it's definitely a trick where you don't really have, like custom cards don't really make a set. What's up, Rattling Bones? Talking about MTG. Talking about MTG today, but this is very applicable to lore, right? Um, so I'm going to try to keep going without doing too much chat interaction, but I definitely want to do it when I can. Um, so yeah, in terms of making a set off of a set skeleton, really what I learned, and this is like a combination of what I read from Mara as what I learned personally is one, there's almost this like prerequisite groundwork you need to do for a set, which is obvious. Like I knew this, but how exactly and when exactly it worked, I didn't really know. So the first thing that you kind of need to do is work on set themes. Um, for magic, uh, that means things like certain, like multicolor or stuff like tight matters, right? Like Theros is a really good example since it was an enchantment uh, driven set. Like there's graveyard driven sets, right? I think that it's pretty well known, but some sort of, some sort of identifiable thing that you can say, oh, like for example, my idea was my set would be an artifact set, right? Because it was a return to Kaladesh. Um, what I learned here was that mechanical, like, there's top down and bottom up design, which always confuses the crap out of me since there's really blurred lines. And I think that there's no, I think that a hybrid approach is always best. So when I first made my set, I actually, um, I actually did both. 
I created a theme for my set, right? Obviously, I couldn't create a plane in the 24 hours I had of working time to make a set. So what I did was I was like, oh, I'm going to revisit Kaladesh that I played a pro tour for multiple Kaladesh sets. So I know the cards really well. Um, they haven't gone back to that plane uh, and artifacts uh, restrict restriction breeds creativity and whatnot. I thought that it would be pretty, pretty stellar to make an artifact set. Um, and what I did was I, I both made some mechanics for that set. Like I think salvage and ether battery were some of the two, two ones that I made early. And I also wrote a backstory. Um, I also wrote a backstory for that set, which was really fun and also embarrassing because I'm not a good writer. Um, but my idea here, and then I created a theme for uh, each of the colors, uh, what kind of the clans were of the set. This was like, you know, an hour or two of work. So not near what magic writers would go through. But my, my idea was I wanted a, um, well, I shouldn't bump around so much. I wanted a sort of thematic wrapper for my set. But what I learned and what I actually read later in one of Morrow's articles is that generally you kind of choose bottom up or top down. But for me, I'm going to my teaching is internalize this as mechanical versus thematic. So basically, when you start making your set, the first thing that you want to do is decide whether it's going to be based on mechanics. So what I mean by that is that we saw set themes for Journey to Nyx like our like enchantments matter, graveyard matters, right? Filling your graveyard. Th those are the those are the mechanic themes of Journey to Nyx, the set. Thematically, Journey to Nyx is all about mythical Greeks and heroism and like defeating weird monsters, right? Which is a really cool theme and both of those work, but you really need to pick a lane. So I actually put a note in the doc, like just pick one. Um, and actually I would, I would guess that a lot of like enfranchised magic players probably are interested in making a mechanical based set, but I would actually recommend to go outside your comfort zone um, and potentially go with the opposite of whatever your gut is J just, just to try to practice and learn. Um, but that was the first thing I learned. A uh, unified set vision. Now, this is something that is really hard to accomplish um, when you are working alone, right? A set vision is a combination of game designers, narrative, like producers. Like when you make a set vision, the example here is like Battle for Zendikar, stop alien Eldrazi from destroying Zendikar. Is awesome and Magic does this really well. Like you want to make sure that your set feels uh, like, like you're kind of, in some sort of fight, in some sort of struggle, like what what is a player actually doing as they you know sort of if you if you will are acting as a planeswalker on that plane? Like what is what is the goal and what does the set feel? Um, for me, I I did make one, um, which was sort of this sort of environmental apocalypse, ground resources, adapt and survive, which I think is fair, but not really that stellar. Um, but something that you need to do is kind of take into account how this is going to affect your set in terms of what you really want the gameplay to accomplish. And one thing that I kind of created uh, as a result of this is that this is something that I don't think is recommended uh, by any of Mara's articles, but I kind of worked this out on my own is I call it gameplay pillars. Um, and I think that Hearthstone actually kind of does this really well. Like a good example is um, during the mech expansion, there were like spare parts, um, and then also they have like minions in another set. They do this really nicely because they have neutral cards, but they kind of create this unifying gameplay within a set that kind of changes the standard environment. Um, the draft or limited environment revolves around it. And for me, I really wanted a reason to justify cards. Um, so this is kind of something that I added into the set design process, which is like, you want gameplay pillars. You want players to have a unique experience within your set. I think that if your set is just a rehash or revisit, challenge is a little boring. So for me, I had a few. Um, the big one was I wanted players to have more incentive to play cards pre-combat um, because I felt that generally in Magic, it's not correct to play things pre-combat. Um, obviously, you do it, you know, what, what, when it's good. But what if we made a set that actively actively both sheltered players so not as many blowouts um you know combat blowouts and stuff that can punish people for it while also just having mechanics that that reward making you have better attacks proactive games um really pushing your advantage make not necessarily making aggro good but just making proactivity good and i really felt that that was good for me because whether we accomplished it or not it 
really a it really helps me just uh say say it that, that i can justify a card so what i mean by justifying a card is let's look at um hmm, let's look at like a card like zarator ritualist right it's a four, four mana four two that puts two ether batteries into play which is very clearly like the play pattern here in a red aggressive deck is you probably have some setup. You play a Zerator Originals on five, like a five mana four two, something you would pr pretty much never play pre combat if it didn't have haste, uh, to sort of create some proactive gameplay. And all of a sudden, that that pillar of like, oh, does this do does this incentivize players to play things pre combat? If yes, then it can go into the card file, and then obviously you can always remove it. But what that does is it just creates the ability for you to sort of like, you know make cool moments in games and have your set make sense because like i talked about with the set skeleton a set skeleton doesn't really make a set and this is kind of you know what what i added to what watsi's approach in terms of like something i think um the other things i added which i'm sure that they do but they probably don't announce these publicly is to sort of create product goals and design goals uh these are you know i realize that these are very these are very game devy terms um, but I think that in general, it's important if you want to step into the space, you want to make a set, your set has to do something unique and it has to do something for a certain type of player. Because if you try to make a set, especially in magic that has all sorts of different player types, like players that play commander, players that play only limited, players that play only legacy, players that play pioneer, players that play on arena, players that play like draft or cube on magic online only. Um, I, it's, it's hard to make an all encompassing set. So having a product goal in terms of, okay, I'm going to make a set that's this many cards. It's going to cater to commander players. It's also going to be independent of draftable format. It isn't the most sexy part of the process, but I think that that is another thing that you can always use to justify a card. And I think that card justification is really important because this is a thing in card games. Like as long as you do something for a reason, it's almost always correct. Obviously, you can you can be wrong about that, but it's like, oh, I made this play because I thought they had X. Maybe they didn't have X. You're still ultimately building towards something, right? So that's pretty important. Um, design goals. So this is pretty straightforward. I had design goals for my own set. I think we'll go over those. Um, whether or not I hit them is is something. But I wanted to make a really accessible set that had high appeal to a commander at EDH. Not sure if I actually got there and reuse and improve on existing arch archetype mechanics. Another thing that is, you know, I have this in the blue category of like, have some ideas as you start, but move and improve on them as you go. Like, I think that one thing that you can get really hung up on is having a design goal, like for me, like the EDH goal, not necessarily fitting it, and then retroactively, like, not mauling your set, but having to change way too much in order to achieve it. I think that it's good to go a bit wide here. Maybe have two or three design goals. Maybe you don't hit them all. Was appealing types. So I wasn't really thinking about financial slash market reasons. Re reasons. I just, I'm not a ex. I don't know anything about developing magic. Okay. But uh, from a game development standpoint, like if you have a target audience or target audiences, right, for a product release, that release is going to be better for those players. And I think ultimately Magic creates a lot of products. That's one of their strengths, right? They have they have like their sets they make every year. They have the bonus sets like Modern Horizons 2 that have more catering. They have like the commander releases and the dual decks that uh, cater to those kind of players. I think that they can actually afford to hyper-focus, not hyper-focus, but focus their content. Because because from my, my perspective, you could make six sets a year for everybody. But just to answer Gold Links' question, I don't think that actually is a better, necessarily, it could be done really well, but I don't necessarily think it's a better player experience than having your four normal sets, right? Which, like, when I say normal, I mean, like, are for your drafters, are for your standard players. Have your additional products that are like, oh, these are for your modern players, these are for your legacy players, these are for your commander players. Because if you just think about it, like, historically, you know, it's kind of hard to make legacy cards or I think they've had this problem a lot or commander cards through standard because any, any standard set has that legality. So, so there's a, there's like a lot of reasons I think that you want to focus your set towards a certain audience, but I don't know for sure. That is just a guess. So, so I could be totally wrong there. 
Um, set mechanics. So there's another pretty good article here by, by Mauro in terms of like how to make set mechanics. Honestly, I didn't even read this one because I think that for me, I have my own way of making this. And um, one, once I had my sort of like, uh, so to speak, set Kaladesh Reforge, a lot, a lot of my, or Fractured Fate, a lot of my ideas for set mechanics were like, one, you know, how, how do you create a set mechanic? It's actually like, it's actually a, a chicken versus the egg kind of thing where it seems almost impossible sometimes. I guess I can look, we can look at the Kaladesh ones. Um, oops, we can look at the, we can look at my sets uh, ones instead of, instead of the template. Um, how do you make set mechanics? So one, right, you have your themes of the set, which for me was like pre, which was an artifact set that kind of goes back and returns you to Kaladesh, has some of the similar mechanics. Um, I had gameplay pillars around pre-combat setup, artifacts matter, but not artifacts driven. Um, so what I did was I pretty much based my mechanics based off the plane I was revisiting and also just my gameplay pillars. So like the first one I had, the first one I think I made was Ether Battery, which is a token artifact that sacrifices to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. Might be busted, might need to actually cost mana to do that. I, I don't know. I don't really care. Um... But the idea there was, first off, I had Kaladesh and I had energy, and I knew I wanted to remove energy uh, because I don't think it's necessarily something I wanted in my set. But I wanted to have that sort of plus one, plus one token, sort of ether energy uh, thematic as well as gameplay mechanics in the set. So that's kind of how I came up with ether battery. Uh, at first, I thought it was going to be in all colors, but as I progressed, I realized, okay, maybe this is just in green and red. And maybe then that can help me map other mechanics, like the chief mechanic, which is something I created, which is sort of like at the beginning, it's pretty simple. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if this creature has the greatest or tied uh, with the greatest power among creatures in play, when this ability goes on the stack, give it plus two, plus two. Kind of like a, a mechanic where you have one big snowball unit. It's, it's simple. You understand what it's going to achieve right it's like oh i've got one big fat unit but then there's depth to it where it's like wait wait a second how do i get two units to the same size so that they both activate right so i think it's pretty pretty simple and elegant in that but also has some creative depth to it um and ultimately this plays into pre-combat setup right it's like well in my set i really want players to do things pre-combat chief is kind of a way of accomplishing that so so hopefully that makes sense that's kind of how i went about making making set mechanics we're going to go over all the cards uh pretty soon here once i once i finish with the holistic how to make a set um so yeah and the last two things are color themes and archetypes so color themes i will note if you make a thematic based set theme then your color themes are probably going to be more uh things like mood boards things like inspiration from actual real places on earth right like what, what do your characters in these colors look like and then you want to make themes and mechanics based on them um in terms of uh color mechanics for my set uh mace mostly i sort of created the mechanics first um but i also in my detail design sort of both which was a mistake but i both thematically made it as well as sort of creating some of the mechanics for the colors and then that really trickled sorry for all the jumping around wait where, where where's my uh i lost my uh i think i have it here right i think i have it here yeah the template um but then going into that and creating archetypes and these are things that you don't need to do like i i feel like i thought oh i'm gonna fill out an archetype grid but what i really learned was you want to Kind of fill out your archetype grid as you go and the important part about the archetype grid is once you have your color themes like each color should be doing something right a black red archetype shouldn't just be like the salvage portion like the mono like the black half uh, because i felt like that was something that it just doesn't make any sense for that to be a multicolored archetype and that can actually drive you because sometimes what happens and that's how i ended up making Oh crap, I'm doing the thing again. That's how I ended up making Chief was like, I didn't have a second mechanic for green, uh, which was fine. I, I had this sort of like plus one, plus one counters matter, which wasn't really a, a mechanic in terms of a keyword, um, but I realized, okay, we're definitely missing something that makes 
uh, green special and have some texture, which is why I came up with the chief mechanic. Um, and yeah, that's it for archetypes. If you're really interested in this, um, obviously this spreadsheet will get you started. I have, I still have to put artifacts and lands and multicolored cards in here, but this is as, as good as I could get it in like three hours in terms of this is all based on the set skeleton, like, and Crimson Val, like how many cards should be in each set. Um, this is definitely like super basic. I'm not a spreadsheet expert or anything, but if you just want to get started, this is really nice. Any of these after line H, you can just literally hide all this if you want to. Um, and that's probably a better take. Um, but yeah, that is it for the um, template. Uh, unless anybody had any questions. Um, if anybody had any questions, I'll take them now. Sorry, my, my headset died. Yeah, the template is solid. It's not like it's not like revolutionary or anything, but just do everything in order. Work on your cards, rinse, repeat, um, and that's what you got. Um, but yeah, I think it's time to kind of review what we made, um, if that makes sense. I had a script and I didn't. I didn't actually. Uh, I didn't actually read off it at all, which is hilarious. Not a script, but I just had like things things that i wanted to to say um so yeah i mean i think the big thing is that that i i guess i would reiterate is that making the content is easier than you think giving you actually work through the process beforehand obviously like i didn't really have time to do everything um but what i would say is that even still i could go t two or three times as fast if I if I made the mechanics, if I had a set vision and a set theme before I even made any cards at all, uh, maybe you have some cards that are I would call them like test cards, where it's like almost a proof of concept, where it's like, oh, I make a few cards just so that we can see the salvage mechanic. When are we drafting the set? So I don't actually know. I mean, we could try to draft the set. I think we could. I don't know if it would be good. There's a lot of busted cards and there's a lot of cards missing. I I kind of want to set it down because I don't want to obsess over it. Part of the part of the goal with the challenge was literally like I want to do this quick just to see if I can. And then it morphed into this whole like, oh shit, you kind of can make cards, but making a set is more complicated than you think. Um I could maybe make a cube with all the cards. I know that one of my friends at Watsy, actually, I don't know if he still has it, David McDarby, but he has a Pokemon cube, which is just a custom cube. There are definitely resources. Yeah, I think that maybe we could set up a draft at some point. That could be kind of fun. But yeah, let's get into Kaladesh Fragmented Fate. I think it's going to be pretty quick, um, but I want to go over everything that we did. I want to probably, we're not going to go over every card, unfortunately. I will link the spreadsheet so that people can see it. Um, but what I want to do is I want to go over the mechanics and maybe I think a good idea is to go over some of my favorite cards within them. Um, so we've already talked about this a decent amount, but um, what I wanted to do was make a set that revisited a Kaladesh. I wanted to sort of capture the initial uh, spark of Kaladesh, but kind of in a more, 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 um, it's kind of weird. So initially, I thought I was going to have some sort of a post-apocalypse Kaladesh. Um, what ended up happening was, because I both thematically and mechanically made the set at the same time, like I, I made mechanics, like the ones you see here, I made the thematics, which are like, ether droids are taking over all the energy, um, I ended up having to almost write over some of the thematics, because I was just so mechanically driven that it ended up not all making sense once they overlapped, which is fine. Um, but yeah, for set themes, um, the big, the big one that I'll call out is that I thought I was making an artifact set. I thought this is Kaladesh. It's going to be all about artifacts. That's what it's about. And maybe I can pull up Scryfall for a second here. And what I realized is that, let's pull up Metalcraft. What I realized was that one of the things I wanted to do in in my set was I wanted this make do like a post-apocalyptic world color identity. Um, and what I mean by that is like, I kind of thought that in artifact sets, 
artifacts are primary and colors are secondary. But what if we made an artifact set where like the colors really determined like each color was using artifacts in a different way. I thought that that was like almost like a hook, right? Where it's like, well, you're going to be able to use artifacts, but each different tribe. And I think that, you know, I think that these old sets like Scars of Mirrodin, which is an artifact set, kind of does that, right? You kind of have like red doing red things. They're kind of empowered when you have Metalcraft, which is like a little bit boring. You've got like green and black that have Metalcraft, but there's also Infect in them, which is like, there's like multiple things you can be doing, but not putting artifacts in play. Um, and I felt like it wasn't, I feel like these old sets aren't that cohesive with artifacts. And what I realized was that I was not actually interested in these mechanics that spam artifacts. I think the really good example of this here, which is actually why I pulled this up, is Chrome Steed. So Chrome Steed is kind of a cool card. You know, it's a four mana artifact. It's a common, which is kind of crazy, that Metalcraft gets plus two, plus two. It's, it's not actually said here, but what Metalcraft does is once you have three artifacts in play, it turns on Metalcraft. And I think that, like, I don't think that 2020, 2021 or 2022, like, Magic devs would remake this mechanic. I actually don't think it's a bad mechanic. I just think that the whole, like, oh, spam a bunch of artifacts, very binary, right? Like, once you have three, you get it. So you're, not only do you really want to just spam artifacts, but, like, your opponent really wants to just play Shatter and disrupt you. It's very much of a um, sort of, uh, what's the word? It's Metalcraft is very, very pivotal, right? And a, a lot of the set revolves around that. And when I played in PTQs of this format, almost all the decks, this was the craziest PTQ format ever, Scars of Mirrodin, like six packs of Scars of Mirrodin, um, because, and I, and I don't kid, I kid you not, I played five PTQs. So I'm talking like, maybe I played like 50 rounds. This was before like you really played on Magic Online I, I, that I played on it. Is that everybody was just red white. 80% of the games you played were against red white. <laughs> because like, I think around 16 of the cards in your deck were artifacts. Right? And it didn't really feel that great of a sealed format. Um, because there's this so much emphasis is on like having all these artifacts actually in your deck. And I'm not going to go on that too much because I actually think it's kind of a cool, cool mechanic. It's really, it's definitely exciting to like turn everything online. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some problems when you have artifact spam. Obviously like there's affinity, right? Is another example and improvise, which is kind of just like affinity is just kind of, you know, once, I think this affinity is really almost better because a lot of the affinity payoffs are colored spells, right? Um, but what's interesting is I think they just had some balance problems, which, which, which is fine. I don't really care about balance. Um, but there's also improvise. And improvise is, I, I like improvise because I think it's almost like a, what the Kaladesh set brought, which is sort of a more um, fair version of affinity where you actually have to tap your artifacts, but all of your artifacts help, but you still have like colored cards generally, right? Yeah, most of the improvised cards are colored cards. They push you into these archetypes to go, like specifically, I remember the blue archetype with Reverse Engineer and Metallic Rebuke. I think it's pretty well done, but in general, I, I guess I was just finding that all of all of these artifact mechanics were all about spamming artifacts and that's how i came up with the gameplay pillar of artifacts matter but not artifact driven like basically like kaladesh fragmented fate will be an artifact set but has less actual artifacts part of this is also because i ran out of time and i was doing artifacts last but mostly it was like i was excited about the idea of a set theme of artifact tokens like for instance, Ether Batteries and Thopters being a major being a major player, I think that was a really good way of having each color use artifacts without just having like 15 plus card artifact decks. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my decision making there. I don't know if that made any sense at all, but that's kind of how we came up with Ether Batteries for, for Green Red 
And then we have Thopters for both white and blue. Lots of artifact tokens, not really as many artifacts, and then also introducing colored artifacts. So that brings us to our first mechanic. Um, and this is kind of a way to have more color identity, um, make do color identity. Artifact synergy, but still color identity. Um, was, I think this was the first maybe mechanic that I made, which was salvage. Um, let's look at salvage. So salvage is, oops, this is wrong already. Salvage is a mechanic that gives you plus one plus oh for each artifact in your graveyard. And now I realize that this is kind of strange. It's like, well, didn't you just, didn't we just establish that we weren't going to have that many actual artifacts in the set? I think, I think the answer is, um, I wanted salvage to be special in terms of like, you have to actually go out of your way to draft artifacts. And secondly, I wanted it to be self-serving um, because I felt like if the, if the salvage units themselves were artifacts, then you would just want to play a bunch of salvage units in your deck. Because one thing I'll show you as well is I call this like the prowess problem. Um, so I'm trying to think of the set, whatever set like Mardu was in, is that cons of Tarkir? Yeah, like the prowess deck in terms of Tarkir was really interesting because I think prowess is an awesome mechanic, but when you drafted the deck, there's diminishing returns on prowess units. Like how many prowess units do you actually want? Because with prowess, you want to fill your deck with spells, right? You want as many spells as possible to trigger prowess, but then that means every prowess unit you put in your deck actually contradicts itself right so the idea here was that artifacts will be a little bit scarce but art like salvage units themselves will will sort of self-enable and then blue will have mill and black will have sacrifice so you have multiple ways of actually getting artifacts into your graveyard the third thing that i'll mention is that i was very worried about the balance ability of this mechanic it's it's the potential mechanic that could be actually really good in like modern or something, but not really much in draft because you just get like artifact lands, you get all this crazy stuff. Um, but for me, I was pretty satisfied with the idea of okay, it's pretty hard to get these uh, like artifacts in your graveyard. You have tools to do that. The salvage creatures do them themselves, so it's not you are not running into the sort of prowess problem. I can post salvage in the chat from Mark Confidant. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much it for salvage. Like some of my favorite cards. Um, uh, let me see here. We have this like an unblockable salvage unit, which I really like. I created the Thopter Titan, which is a salvage. It's a seven mana, three, three salvage flying. When it enters the battlefield, you create two one, one flying Thopter tokens. And then other artifacts you control have plus one plus oh for each artifact in your graveyard. Um, <laughs> yeah, Thopter Titan. It's a pretty bad name. Um, but, but yeah, I just, I was really loving the, the idea of this sort of like slow grindy, um, artifact deck that used, uh, scry, it used mill. We've got like better sift as a common. That's like, okay, draw three, discard two. Um, so if you do find your artifacts, you can put them in your graveyard and specifically, um, that would kind of help you. Uh, the second mechanic that we have in blue, I guess I'll go to that. Hmm, should I talk more about repurpose? I feel pretty good about it. I guess we can look at the black cards, um, which are kind of more aggressively slanted. We have like the, the two mana bat, one one flying salvage, which actually might be busted at common. Just like it could be like a five one flyer for two mana. We've got the intimidate card. Um, I have the sort of etherborn salvager as a rare, which is this flying salvage unit that when you whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you actually mill until you hit a creature um or an artifact creature and put that in your graveyard so it kind of that helps you fill salvage we also have a common rummage ratch that does the same it's kind of a mechanic where you get artifacts in the graveyard yeah the bat seems pretty busted it probably should be an uncommon or cost like three uh but my hope is that without that many artifacts in the set it might be what's interesting is this kind of like i, I just realized that this mechanic is uh is is almost anti-cranial plating so i kind of want to make a card right now that's like a two mana artifact. That's like enchant creature. Enchant creature gets like the fair version of cranial plating for each creature in your graveyard. I'm not gonna worry about like making it all making it all work, but that's just an idea. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we uh, salvage is doing. Um, you're filling up your graveyard. You've got self mill. You've got sacrifice from black. Pretty straightforward. I think it's pretty clean. 
Um, they might all be busted. They might literally all be busted, but here's the thing. Like, I would expect that's the kind of mechanic that um, we would probably change a lot of the cards throughout development. Like, I think that, like, Flying Salvage 1-3 for 5, like, this kind of just speaks for itself. I really like French Vanilla cards. Um, I think that in Rune Terra, I love it when our French Vanilla cards are good. In Magic, they're rarely good. So I like the idea of a draftable deck where I can just see what my card does. I can build to that win condition. But yeah, it's definitely... Salvage might be completely busted. I don't really care. Maybe maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, um, so to go along with that, one of the things that I really liked, and this is this is actually the weakest mechanic in the set by far, is this mechanic I may call repurpose, which is kind of like flashback, but it has the requirement that you've attacked with two plus artifacts this turn, because I like the idea of one, rewarding Thopter generation and salvage units, two, to create some connective tissue between colors, and two, the idea of just like proactivity matters a lot. Um, so how do I how do I look these up? So let's look at repurpose. We have Artifact Divination, four mana draw two. Uh, you can cast it again from your graveyard if you attack with two plus artifacts this turn, if you do exile it. Um, pretty straightforward. We also have um, Thopter Mission, which is like a two mana artifact. A lot of the blue repurpose cards can actually make you artifacts, which kind of helps you get to the repurpose total. Just a two mana card that makes you a Thopter, but you can flash it back. Another kind of more exciting version of this would be the... Um, repurpose clone it like copies a creature you control but makes it an artifact um which is kind of exciting because that artifact can then let you flash it back and make another artifact which can get pretty degenerate so pretty straightforward mechanic i i do i think where we need to be careful of here is like the instance so i made this card which i really like which is just a two mana combat trick plus two plus two with repurpose so you can cast this if you've attacked with two artifacts you can potentially cast this multiple times while in combat Probably, maybe honestly, should be an uncommon, but I really like the idea of having these plus, like having this reason to attack with your with your artifacts, right? Um, so I didn't go too deep into repurpose. I think it might be the weakest mechanic, especially because I kind of retroactively made the decision that Kaladesh is not an artifact block; it's almost an artifact token block with above average artifact cards. Um, but I really like the idea of it. One problem that you run into here. I would say is the sort of repetitive problem of flashback where it's a lot of the same thing over and over again. So one way that we could improve this mechanic is one, maybe the repurpose cost could be different. Two, maybe you get a bonus for the repurpose. So for ex for example, let's just make let's just make something really quick ad hoc. A, a different version of this card could be plus one plus one. I actually like this better, but it's more complicated, which I don't like. But, like, if you cast this with the repurpose cost, plus two, plus two instead, right? Or draw a card, or create a Thopter, or do a lot of different things. That way, in order to get the flashback power out of it, you need to have the artifacts attacking, which I think is good. Your opponent can interact with that. They can kill your artifact creatures. They can block your Thopters and stuff like that that you might be putting at risk. That's probably a good space to go in. Um, unfortunately, I, I only really worked on this set for like 12 or, or 14 hours or so. So, and I didn't play test with anything, but I think that that's definitely a good space. Another thing we could do is have different costs. Like maybe the repurpose cost costs a little bit more. I think they do this a lot with flashback nowadays where like it costs a lot more to get the effect again, just to avoid that repetitive gameplay of like, oh, do this really strong thing again. Screw you. Um, it's not really always the best gameplay. Uh, cool, but moving on, we have the Ether Battery. So the Ether Battery is something that I kind of created due to my love of just the use of... I like the practical use of energy from original Kyle Dash. I like the idea that a lot of the energy is creating these plus one, plus one encounters, which is just really solid. It's really understandable. It's really approachable. As a player, I'm like, oh, I just want to... I know what I want to do with it, right? I want to put plus one, plus one encounters on a creature and then there's like depth to it where it's like oh wait there's draftable creatures that want you to put plus and plus one counters on them red and black have cards that say whenever an artifact dies right so all of a sudden there, there's so much depth to this simple mechanic 
that in Kaladesh was just kind of like, oh, you spend some of your energy sometimes with plus one, plus one counters. Um, and this also plays into both of our gameplay pillars, right? Pre-combat setup, ether batteries are really good pre-combat. Artifacts matter, not artifacts driven, like artifact tokens being a set theme. Uh, we want to create these tokens. It also thematically is kind of neat where these, these tribes that are like using the energy they have left over to power up. I like that a lot. Um, so this was a pretty big basis that I thought was going to be in five different colors. But what I realized was that if we want our set to have color identity in an artifact set, each individual color needs to be doing something a little bit different with artifacts. So we ended up going just red and green. Um, so green is like completely incomplete. But some examples are just like, um, what are some good examples? Let's look, let's, let's look it up. What is it called again? Ether battery. I was very careful not to make too many of these, but yep, we have a we have a three two uh, trample when Zerater Renegade enters the battlefield. Create an ether battery. Pretty solid. Can be a four three trampler for for four. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned that it's an onboard combat trick that gets buried in the bin. That is definitely true. I think that probably combat tricks shouldn't be used for repurpose that was more of a proof of concept but i could see that being cut um i think magic arena does this really well where any, any resources in your graveyard are pretty pretty shown um but yeah we've got the zeratar renegade creates an ether battery pretty straightforward we've got like uncommon ping spell that creates an ether battery that's also a sorcery you want to do things pre-combat um we've got sort of a lot of mechanics in red around making ether batteries there's this four mana four two that makes two other batteries. I would actually expect this to be a really strong card, uh, common in the set because we have cards like um, uh, what what are the clean cards here that I like a lot? There is like the Muncho Puncho Gremlin, T totally a placeholder name, but whenever you sacrifice an artifact, it's plus two plus zero. Oh. Um, there is the Flame Spinner, which is like a trampler that gives all of your creatures plus two plus zero oh if you sack an artifact. Um, what else do we have? We have like a pinger that only goes to the opponent's face, but when an artifact dies, it untaps itself. Um, what else do we have that works? We've got a lot of stuff that works with other batteries here. We've got some rares potentially, like uh, that you can sacrifice an artifact to exile the top card of your library and you can play it this turn. Um, so we do have the ability to like use our ether batteries, not just for their intended function. Like I, I created sort of a, a maybe more fair shrapnel blast maybe more busted shrapnel blast um that only costs one mana that deals three to things um so pretty pretty straightforward that's kind of how red does it red makes ether batteries red also has these sacrifice artifact synergy or like a really clean card is just the zarator intimidator uh two mana two one when an artifact you control dies might actually be unbelievably busted by the way uh, as many of my cards are since they haven't really gone through any play testing uh, Taro creature can't block this turn, so you can use an ether battery, make something not block, pump something else. We're, we're playing into all of our sets themes, right? We're playing into our gameplay pillars and the set themes. Really, really great. Green is using ether batteries a bit differently. So one, green doesn't do sacrifice, but they do have a few different things. They have, um, they have this plus one plus one counters matters which is a mechanic that actually was from Karns of Tarkir a little bit. So we just have a two mana two two that each creature you control with the plus one plus one gun has reach. Sure, ship it. Uh, we've got like an uncommon that each creature you control with plus one plus one plus one counters, excuse me, have trample. So, you know, you can put plus one plus one counters on it, give it trample, you can give other units trample. Green is really incomplete, but this is kind of my vision for it. And then you have the chief archetype, uh, or sorry, the chief mechanic, which pretty much, um, and one thing about chief is it this is like really awkward wording but i wanted to make sure that this didn't check on resolution like if this checked on resolution then something getting pumped by this uh, if you had two creatures the same size they wouldn't both get pumped so i was very specifically like okay how can we make it so they both get pumped so i feel like this mechanic once need like has not existed in magic where it's like oh if you have units that are even size that are also the biggest um they get pumped one mana one with chief i i like the idea one de butter uh one mana one with chief it's a bit snowbally like having a three three on turn two is a lot but also it's just very sharp because later in the game it won't like a one one will never have chief because it's too small right 
But yeah, I really like this as a compliment. And this is one of the mechanics that I made at the end where I was like, well, green needs a little bit more other than ether batteries. A uh, white needs a little bit more other than making making tokens and, and giving plus one plus one tokens. Um, so we gave them the chief mechanic. It's not on that many cards, but here we just have a, a two, three. This card might be really strong, but it's kind of hard to chief it because it only has two attack. Two mana, two, three for four that has chief. So if it's the biggest unit, when it goes into combat, it gets plus two, plus two. Um, once again, let's get pre-combat actions. Um, whenever I enter play, create one ether battery. So you can use that to, to give something chief. We just have a big, we just have our craw worm, right? With trample, big five, five trampler. If you give it chief pump um, and a lot of, a lot of plus one, plus one counters and a lot of, I didn't get to it, but hopefully a lot of pump spells. Like a cool card here is a is an enchantment that gives all of your creatures chief, and then it has multiple activated abilities. This should probably be sorcery only. I don't know, um, but to allow you to sort of like the level one of chief is like, oh, I'm like a Timmy player. I I want to make one big unit that has chief and, and pound my opponent in. But then the next level was like, how do I get two chief units at the same size at the same time? Do I use ether batteries, right? Do I use pump spells? Do I use like fight spells? Um, stuff like that. And then, you know, some pretty pretty generic cards for green. Not not really that noteworthy, but I wanted to make sure there was some texture beyond just like I'm 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 this kind of beat down trample color. Cause normally green has ramp. Green didn't really have ramp in my set. So we have a one mana one two reach flyer that or sorry, reach unit that spider, I guess, when it enters battlefield draws a card. I feel like all the time I see sets of magic, they'll put a reach creature in that is just not main deckable, right? And it is, I think that's fine. I think it's fine to have good sideboard cards, but sometimes they're just like three mana, one five reach or one four reach that are just not playable. So my idea here, and this is just like a random design tidbit was what if we made a reach creature that sucks? It's a one, two. So it's not like if my opponent has flyers, they can't be like, it's not that binary, right? Obviously, it's really good against Thopters, which is part of the idea. But a reach unit that can go in more decks in the main deck that actually helps combat all the Thopters that are going to exist, right? And then, like, so, sort of an artifact creature that... Or sorry, a creature that when an artifact dies, you gain two life. Gives you some way of getting some sustain and maybe make some more comboy decks. We also have a nice reprint here, which is the Blood Briar, which is, like, whenever you sacrifice another permanent blood, a plus one, plus one counter on, on me... So I'm pretty satisfied with the green mechanics. I actually think that Chief and Ether Battery are probably my favorites. Um, salvage, I really like Salvage, but I think executing on it is really difficult in an artifact set because of some of the balance problems, because of some of the like, well, one of the problems with Salvage is like, you know, I've got a lot of artifact tokens. Those don't actually go in your graveyard. So that kind of feels bad. Obviously black doesn't really have those mechanics, but it's still something. Um, and yeah, so moving right on, I'm just going to plow through this. Um, so I made it, so I made this mechanic on the first day. Um, and I didn't realize I made it until later, but one of my design goals, and this is, this is a retrofit where I don't actually have that many cards right now, but part of my detail design was specifically like, I wanted high appeal to commander and EH players. Cause I, I felt like that might be a weakness of my design is designing more for spike and designing more for competitive players and maybe designing for standard i've never made a magic card before so who knows but i was like okay what can i do here so i made this wheel mechanic which i don't know if people remember the gaunty that i made but basically how it works is like you choose a player that player completes the action and then chooses another player to complete the action and you kind of go around it reminds me of in werewolf when you have the wheel at the end of the day where people are making people safe and then the last two people get put onto the tribal council basically and what i liked about this was i had some ideas of like cards like um i wanted to make a new cataclysmic gear hulk uh let's look at the cataclysmic gear hulk here i wanted to make cards like cataclysmic gear hulk that used wheel where instead of each player choosing their own thing players choose for them and you kind of wheel it off them. Um, I had the idea of like fixing Gaunty because the problem I had with, I think that Gaunty was one of like the loved and hated cards from original Kaladesh that I wanted to bring back and ultimately like stealing other people's cards, touching their deck and everything is pretty toxic. But if we attach it to like a, an e, a commander, like multiplayer EDH mechanic where 
you gaunty somebody and then they get to choose somebody to gaunty and they get to choose somebody to gaunty and they get to choose somebody to gaunty. I feel like that actually made the mechanic so much better because all of a sudden it becomes this fun shared experience that you really get to choose who you pick. And then the sort of um, the next step, which I, I'm su super sad. Maybe I'll make if people have interest in me making some of these cards, I'll make some more of them. Um, but none of them are on paper right now. They're all just in my noggin um, cards were like using the wheel mechanic. Like imagine a car that was like had wheel. Imagine it was like a, a creature that comes into play and it deals. It, it's a wheel that deals damage that decreases every time you use the wheel, right? Where it's like, OK, uh, I choose a player that player uh, like loses 10 life. What, what They choose a player that player loses five life. They choose a player that plays uses three, um, which I really like in multiplayer a lot. But it's also a mechanic, especially with the escalation, that would potentially work in draft. One of my big problems I remember was that it felt like um, it felt like specifically I think the voting mechanic didn't really work in one v one draft, which uh, made it a bit sad. It f felt kind of bad that those were determined outcomes. Um, so those are those are some of my ideas that I wanted to do in terms of getting getting a uh, more commander driven set. Those are some of my ideas. That was kind of what I had there. Um, still work in progress obviously I, I didn't spend so much time on this set uh, especially since i spent so much time learning about making sets um the last one i made was amalgamate so what's the backstory here one i love i love equipments i love it's really good to have mana sinks in your set it's really good to have these colorless augments that all decks can kind of use um and one thing that i was always interested in was this sort of and i kind of i don't think i ever thought of this before but i always how, how do i how do i do this yeah it's kind of like a wear mechanic right i really really love bestow i felt like bestow was a really solid mechanic for a bunch of reasons one i think that enchantment creatures it just it's just so i just it's i can't get enough of it honestly it's like they they made cards in the past that were just like three mana three three like the card from future sight that's just like a three mana three three fly that's an enchantment creature like it has no reason to be an enchantment creature right and what i really like about bestow is one the gameplay is really good like auras that don't you don't get blown out right when your opponent has the removal spell because you get your unit back gives you some inherent card advantage but you have to pay like a huge premium sometimes like look at these bestow creatures like like this uncommon is like four mana but it costs six to bestow or whatever um you need to pay the premium in order to get that the value and you get it and it's a much it's just so clean I, I can't get enough of it so i kind of was always thinking like what what if equipment worked in the same way what if we had equipments that uh, work that way and part of and part of the reason and this is why it's important especially when you're doing callback sets is to sort of do research on the set before is that you know we had vehicles we had vehicle in original and let me show you what i mean by this in original kaladesh we had vehicle let me see a vehicle oh this is a really bad example this one and what was really s sick about this mechanic was one it's kind of this cool thing that seems like it'll be in an adventure's paradise two they they have the actual power and toughness of the vehicle on the vehicle right which doesn't prior to this didn't make any sense because like this is not a creature right this does not trigger creature um this does not trigger creature abilities right this doesn't trigger like soul warden game one life when you when you play a creature it they, they took a risk here with this but i think it worked out really well uh they have like the special border for it too which i, I really never even noticed uh having played this set but i really like this idea of like stats existing on cards being like almost augmentable right being this like thing that Physically, I can see in play and understand that that's like a mechanic that this will become a 6-6. Six, six. So my idea here was pretty simple. Okay, maybe, maybe this is one of the more complicated mechanics. But I wanted equipment that basically were creatures. 
and could attach onto other creatures. So the idea is, um, I don't have that many of these since I think that I wasn't super, like I wasn't going to go super deep here since I, it was one of the last mechanics I made. Um, but I like the idea of attachments that give you your power and keywords. So literally, like this is just a hill giant that you could pay for to equip to something. Um, and have that similar bestow situation where you have a nice mana sink. Um, it's really, really good into our, like, we want to do things pre-combat. And I like the idea of grafting the keywords. I realize that this, like, keywords is not a thing in Magic. So it might have to, like, be more specific. I didn't really care to solve this so much in initial design. As much as I just like the cleanliness of, like, oh, it's a 2-2. Two -two. When I attach, when I physically attach this to another unit... Like, it doesn't say equip creature gets plus two plus so. It just is a 2-2. Two -two. And I can see that on the card. And I think that that is very similar to what vehicles were doing. And part of the reason I wanted this was because Kalash is this place for inventors, I actually felt like this was very thematic, but also a really cool callback where it's like, oh, we are using the ca artifact card power and toughness card frame again in a new way. I don't know, you know, I don't have that many viewers right now. It's hard to say, but I imagine this would kind of be exciting for people to see that rediscovery, see that using the card frame as a mechanic, um, which previously would have to write out, like when you crew this, it becomes a 6-6, six -six, kind of like Mutavault. I really like this a lot. I think it's pretty elegant. One thing that I did in my set too was um, another thing I noticed. This is a super small thing, but I wanted these... A lot of these cards can only be activated as a sorcery speed. Yeah, we did see something like with this Augment. It's actually very similar, except I think Augment was from hand instead of from play. Um, but yeah, I think it's very similar to Augment. Um, but I think those also... Would those, would those move keywords along? I, I don't know. Anyway, I don't really care so much. Um... What was I going to say? What was I going to say? Oh, I really wanted... I wanted to change activate this ability only as a sorcery to activate this ability only during your main phase. I realized that... Um, and another example of this would be the Defiant Salvager, which is actually a reprint-ish, but this would be a functional reprint that actually changed where it's like, oh, this ability can activate only during your main phase. I don't know. I think this is almost archaic that magic still uses... And this is just like, I don't... I don't claim to be some sort of like genius or anything in terms of game design, but I think that the activate only as your sorcery is like outdated because you don't really want to put the text sorcery, like activate only when you could play a sorcery. You shouldn't define a keyword based on some other thing that isn't, that needs to be defined. I realize that main phase still kind of needs to be defined, but personally, if I was looking at, because one of the ideas for the set was it, was it to be very simple. I, I thought that I'd be good at making a low complexity set. Um, I like the idea of moving all of the cards that activate only as a sorcery to activate only as your main phase, get players more familiar with what a main phase is and not have to like think about, oh, wait, I can activate this activated ability when I can play a sorcery, but a sorcery is an activated ability. Very strange, but just something small I did. Um, so that was pretty much it with the mechanics. I mean, in terms of our archetypes we kind of had we went over them a bit uh we've got thopters what up james we got thopters for blue white we've got sacrifice plus artifact tokens so thopters plus sacrifice we've got the salvage self mill blue black red black is artifact tokens plus summer purpose uh black red is and this is like kind of incomplete obviously i didn't complete the full set but ether battery mid-range um, where you use artifacts to your advantage. We have got the sort of like chief and plus one plus one matters for, for green whites. Um, so that's pretty much it. I think maybe the last, for the last few minutes here, since I didn't want to stay on too long today, um, I just want to kind of get the video out there. Um, I kind of want to go over some of my favorite cards, maybe. Um, I should have done this beforehand. Um, I'm just going to go through each color and pick like two favorites. Um, so let's do that. So first one, I think I would choose, I do really like Cogworker, just a one mana one one that creates a one one Thopter token with flying. Uh, when it dies, I feel like this is kind of, what's nice about this is it's almost like a callback to like Doom Traveler. I, I think they've done this kind of card often. This is sort of like Kaladesh's version of it. 
um it kind of plays well within with repurpose because it's a it plays well within the token matter matters and repurpose uh, ideas because it is a colored creature that creates artifacts it might be a tiny bit of power creep but i don't think that this would cause too many problems would probably be a good standard card i'm sure in this thing another another simple common uh put a plus one plus one counter on target creature it gains chief until end of turn i really like the sort of combination of a permanent pump and a temporary pump that was pretty nice um what else did we have here uh kind of a timmy car that i really liked that is like okay enchant creatures indestructible uh this is supposed to be an aura i didn't didn't finish all the spreadsheet work because it just took way too much time i'll fix that later but whenever it attacks you put x counters on it equal to its power um which is kind of exciting with a lot of the plus one plus one counters matters uh kind of things but yeah that's pretty pretty straightforward um we've got like the bountiful angel which is like a flat this card's busted by the way i think this is supposed to be three uh but it puts a plus one plus one counter on all other creatures you control and whenever a plus one plus one counter is put on a creature you control you give them flying um so yeah another cool rare that maybe just really lets you dip into ether batteries or dip into making plus one plus one counters um moving on to blue one of my favorite blue cards here maybe busted but i like tinkerer's reverb scry one draw one and create a thopter token for two might want to be an uncommon but who cares again um just a simple card that kind of helps you dig and create thopter tokens and turn on repurpose i don't love it that the thopter tokens aren't always that great with salvage so they might be two different decks um but i think another one we already talked about was the um robotic imprinting which is like a clone that turns it into an artifact but then you can flash it back with repurpose pretty cool pretty straightforward i like the thopter titan like big dumb big dumb flyer that creates thopters they all get pumped very similar selection spell oh yeah the the super filter well this card is actually very similar to um telling time uh it's just a little bit better i think because one goes into the graveyard which i think plays really well with both repurpose and of course salvage you want some self mill some texture for players to think about their choices here what else do i like here it seems pretty solid i, I made a sphinx this this before i actually named this card uh it was named we need a sphinx because i feel like every set has a sphinx um and the idea here is this card might be a card that already exists so when it comes into play you scry three uh, and I thought this was very sphinxy. Then you choose land or non-land. Then you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal the chosen type. Um, and all all reveal cards go into your hand. So you basically get the decision of like, you get to scry. If you want a bunch of lands, you can maybe draw a bunch of them. If you want a bunch of spells, you can maybe draw a bunch of them. I'm not the greatest at making rares, but I thought that this was pretty nice. Uh, moving on to black. Um, I really I really like the rummage rats. What I don't like about them is a common that has this much text. I realize magic does this all the time, um, but just kind of a one mana two one that gets you an artifact in your graveyard. I don't think it's I don't think it's too overpowered. I don't think it is like there might be some crazy combo deck, but the cards go on the bottom of your library, not in your graveyard. But you could use this to like tutor an artifact. So I actually maybe this should cost probably should cost two mana, honestly, uh for like eternal formats, but uh, maybe should be a one one there's a lot of things but anyway I, I like that idea of like having these salvage matters cards um i liked getting the sort of where's the epigon of the vault this is sort of a callback to disciple of the vault that now it is now um 2021 so like it only counts artifacts that you that have died on your side of the battlefield um it it does a drain it also notably there's some like there's some really small design decisions here that maybe I can make a separate video about those, but this is specifically not targeting the opponent because it's a lot better for digital magic. And it's also each opponent since that's a bit, bit better for commander. Just some small decisions there that I think are pretty nice. We've got a grave digger that mills you three first, actually doesn't target. It's a choice selection. Um, just more, should be three black, black, huh? But Oh God, but this is actually just a lot more uh, palatable when you don't have anything in, in your graveyard. Um, we have another maybe busted card, but I really like this sort of like uh, fringing the edge of uh, each player sacrifices a non-land permanent. Like what would lax like maybe ability to kill artifacts, which they can't actually do look like. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. Scrapping Scrounger is a nice reprint. Um, 
We've got the Masker Mage, which is like whenever an artifact dies, all, all enemy creatures get minus one, minus one. Sacrifice a creature, uh, target creature gets minus one, minus one. Reminds me of Phyrexian Plague Lord a lot, but can potentially do some serious work with artifacts. Red, I think red was actually my best color. Um, it wasn't necessarily deep at rare, but I think the mechanics work really well. And I think also I spent a lot of time on stream with this and also went back on it. Um, so we've got a lot of aggressive like hard file cards, you know, like cards that fit into a uh, set skeleton, but we also have a lot of synergy. I think if I had to pick my favorite card, it might be the Intimidator. Just a two one that whenever a creature, whenever an artifact you control dies, you hurt because you can't block. I think that's going to be insane. Maybe actually just busted with a bunch of um, ether batteries and artifact sacrifice cards. Um, I think the other one that I really liked was two 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 uncommons. One was the flame spinner, which is like when you sack artifacts, things get bigger. But the other one was the fuel channeler. I, I should have done more cards like this, but an actual synergy. It's like a one mana. It's sorry. It should be two. Oh god, I messed it up. Um, oh god, it's not really that that difficult. I just wasn't really looking. Go down one. There we go. The one mana one two that creates another battery, and then you can remove plus one plus one counters to ping things. I thought that was a kind of a cool way of both thematically tying into like red consuming resources here, and also like paying off for doing ethering batteries in a red way, like more consumptive, uh, maybe more finishing, and more really about making those combo turns um we have a we have a dragon should have it's supposed to have haste that kind of just does damage when artifacts die i suck at making rares that's what i learned my rares are all i don't know they're all like cookie cutter i think a lot of them are really strong um like a four mana art or this was supposed to be three gives all your artifacts tap to deal one to any target i think i do okay here but not great and then we already went over green uh, so I think that's going to be it. Thank you, everybody, for who stuck through with this. Um, I realize that this is not my normal content, but I'm trying this year to do more game design stuff. Um, so I will stop here for any questions. But if not, that's going to be it for me on the stream. Maybe we can upload this to YouTube, get some momentum there, share the knowledge. Um, I guess I, I really didn't do a great job of framing everything I wanted to do. But just to conclude, like, I feel like when I went into this challenge, I was like super excited to like flex and be like, oh, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a bunch of magic cards. That's gonna be sick. And then I learned like, hey, actually, you can make magic cards faster if you learn how to make a set, right? And then after all was said and done, I was super excited to, um, you know, share with people sort of a template I made for myself uh, in terms of making a magic set. So definitely would recommend to check it out. If there is a YouTube video, Twitch channel, it'll probably be down in the description somewhere. Um, but this is definitely a good way to get started on any set. It has pretty much everything that I learned in rapid iteration. Um, and if you follow all the steps here, I'm sure you'll do well. Uh, but yeah, that is it for me. And I'm going to head out because today is Sunday and I still have plenty of weekend left that I don't want to lose. So uh, see everybody later. Peace.